Hello and welcome to Game Tech, talking about the Game Boy Advance this time around. And this is actually the first portable system I ever bought. That's right, I never had a Game Boy, Game Gear, Nomad, nothing like that. This was the first must-have portable system, at least for me anyway. So let's take a quick look at the system itself. The Game Boy the Nintendo Game Boy Advance was released in Japan in March of 2001 and Europe and North America in June of that same year. The original unit features a horizontal layout with a non-backlit screen in the middle powered by two AA batteries which lasts around 15 hours. Revisions were made which are rechargeable and include a backlight, the Game Boy Advance SP being the most popular model. The games come on small cartridges that range anywhere from 4 to 32 megabytes. Officially part of the Game Boy line, it's backwards compatible with both Game Boy and Game Boy Color cartridges. The Game Boy Advance is powered by a 32-bit ARM processor running at 16.8 MHz. Screen resolution is 240 by 160 pixels, with up to 32,768 simultaneous colors, 4 independent background layers, and 128 sprites on screen of varying sizes. The sound is a DAC powered by the CPU itself and it's the weakest point of the system, with many games using a sampling rate of 11 kHz or even lower, giving it a very fuzzy or scratchy quality. Overall, the Game Boy Advance was a huge success, selling over 81 million units worldwide with over 1,500 released games. Alright, so it has some interesting specs, but of course what people always care about the most are the games. And the Game Boy Advance will not let you down on that front. So let's take a look at some games that I find interesting for one reason or another. Let's start off with Mario Kart Super Circuit. This was the fourth best selling title on the Game Boy Advance right behind the Pokemon stuff. And no, sorry, I won't be covering any of the Pokemon games in this episode because I'm just not really into Pokemon. Suffice it to say, people really love their Mario Kart. I can see why, it's a very simple concept. Try to win the race while using items to cheat your way ahead. But it's not really cheating since every other participant in the race can use the same items that you can. This version was developed by Intelligent Systems who were responsible for the Fire Emblem series and even the original Duck Hunt. You can certainly feel the Duck Hunt reach while playing this one. Actually, that's stupid. No, you can't. It mainly looks and plays like the Super Nintendo original only with much better graphics. You've still got the coins on the floor, the hopping power slide, and completely flat tracks without any hills. But there's more detail on these flat tracks, and now the sprites are also scaled properly as well. Even the distant scrolling backgrounds have a lot more going on. The music is good and, well, it's what you'd expect from a Mario Kart game. There's also a link-up feature for you and up to three of your friends to battle, which sadly I can't show you because I have no friends. Overall, it's a good entry into the series and it proved that Mario Kart could even succeed on a portable system. This is Ninja 5.0 from Konami and developed by Hudson. I've rarely heard anyone mention this one. They should though, because it's pretty darn good. In fact, it's on the cusp of being amazing. You're a crime-fighting ninja cop out to take down thugs and rescue hostages. This game reminds me of a mix between Elevator Action Returns, Shinobi, and Rolling Thunder, and that's all definitely a good thing. As you make your way through each area, you can toss weapons to defeat enemies. You can even slash them with your sword. Your sword is also used to open red crates which can contain power-ups or keys to open the same colored doors. Enemies also sometimes drop power-ups and life-ups as well. Your shots get cooler and cooler the more power-ups you get, but if you get hit too many times, your power level will decrease. If you press jump again while in mid-air, you'll extend a grappling hook which you can use to get to higher ledges. You also have full screen ninja magic that you can use if your green bar is full. You need to be careful not to hit hostages. Hit even one accidentally and you'll have to start the entire stage over. And these stages can be pretty big. There are three stages to complete in each area and the fourth one is a boss encounter. It'll only take you a few seconds to get used to the controls and they work extremely well for the most part. The exception is the grappling hook. Most of the time it's perfectly fine but there are points where you need to keep swinging your way higher and higher and it's just not done very well at all. My enjoyment of the game is brought down just a teeny little bit because of this. 
Instead, you can try to go up the sides of the walls in some areas, but be careful. And while I like the music, the problem is that each area has the same music, so it gets old quickly. And it's too bad, because this game is so close to being truly amazing, and they just fell a bit short. It's still definitely worth having, though probably not worth what they're asking for it these days. It's fairly well sought after since it originally didn't sell well at all. There are three Sonic Advance games on the system, each released a year apart. I thought I'd mention these briefly, but there's really not a whole lot for me personally to say about them. I love Sega, I really do. But I simply don't care for Sonic. I just don't see the appeal anymore. But hey, at least these games are built from the ground up for the system, so that's a plus. I actually bought the first one when it was released for some reason. Probably the same reason I keep buying Mario games, but never finish them. I get caught up in the hype during the release and give in. Anyway, three Sonic games are here for you if you like them, and more power to you if you do. Just because I don't like them doesn't mean I'll think less of you if you do. Sorry if I make any of you sad, but hey, we all have our own likes and dislikes. <laughs> And speaking of Mario games, how about Mario & Luigi's Superstar Saga? This is the first game in the rather large Mario & Luigi series, and it's the only one on the Game Boy Advance. This isn't your typical Mario game. Actually, it's like a slightly more complicated Super Mario RPG. Yes, this is an RPG, and once again, you've teamed up with Bowser. However, as you'd guess from the title, you only play as Mario & Luigi, both at the same time. Someone has stolen Princess Peach's voice, and for some reason, they left her alive. Since she still lives, this prompts Mario, Luigi, and Bowser to go on a quest to get her voice back. The battles are kind of similar to Super Mario RPG, with the enemy hopping and pressing the button at the right time for a more powerful attack and whatnot. Though, to me, this feels like Nintendo had just realized that they have not just one, but two different buttons. Don't want them going to waste, gotta use them both all the time. One button controls Mario and the other one controls Luigi. It's not necessarily a bad thing, it just feels like maybe they're pushing this concept a little hard. As you walk around, you can do special jumps. For example, if Mario is leading, Luigi can jump on him and you both will jump higher as a result. If Luigi is leading, Mario can jump on him and you'll do a twirly thing to float across the air for a bit. And sometimes you'll have to switch back and forth again and again a lot just to get to a box that has a coin or a mushroom. The battles also have some combo attacks that I just couldn't pull off well at all, so I stopped trying. It doesn't matter much though, because the enemy attacks are usually easy to dodge. It just takes a lot longer to finish a battle with single attacks. Overall, I like the game. The characters are all really fun, the pacing is perfect, the battles are mostly fun, and the music sounds good. Definitely give this one a try. <laughs> So obviously there's a lot of variety in the game library, but some of my favorite games have always been action and adventure. Turns out the Game Boy Advance doesn't let down in those genres either. Treasure gave us some games on the platform, including Advanced Guardian Heroes. They took their rule about not making sequels and just threw it out the window. I'm very surprised that Treasure did this since they broke away from Konami because they got sick of making sequels in the such. Sega owns the license to Guardian Heroes and they weren't interested in the sequel, so Treasure actually had to license it from Sega and have Ubisoft publish it. Wow, they really changed their minds about sequels. Anyway, this one is a beat-em-up similar to the original Saturn game. It's pretty good, but it's not great. The action is fun and so is using all of your powers. My main issue is that there's a lot of slowdown, especially in Stage 2 and it feels like Stage 2 goes on about three or four times longer than it should. The entire thing is played like this on this little platform. Not very exciting. It also feels like it takes too long to get back up after being knocked down. 
Aside from these two gripes, the game is well made and definitely enjoyable. Once again, you can power up your abilities between stages. You can also invest crystals into some slow-moving research in the laboratory. Most of the stages seem to have their own gimmick, like this one which auto-scrolls with you standing on a glowing circle. The music is pretty good, with lots of tunes from the Saturn game making a return. It's not horribly expensive these days, and you could certainly do worse with your money. In 2005, Treasure blessed us with Gunstar Super Heroes. Yeah, not only did Treasure start making sequels, but now even remakes. Still, this is an awesome game though. It really shows off the scaling and rotation abilities of the Game Boy Advance more than most other games. A lot of the stages from the Genesis original are here. In fact, I think that the Genesis version of this stage looks a lot better. But at least I still get to enjoy these tiny guys freaking out as I destroy their homes for no good reason. <laughs> yeah, look at you, you're now homeless. And yes, of course it still has a dice maze. It's not a straight up remake, there are lots of new stages and additions. And this game loves to pay tribute to Sega. Like this stage, which is basically flicky, only it's rotating around as you play. In fact, a lot of stages love to rotate in this game. Or how about this stage, which is a nod to the arcade version of Thunderblade? There's even more in here, but I'll let you discover that for yourself. The music is also great, though I do think the Genesis version sounds better. Check this out if you want some fast-paced explosive action on your Game Boy Advance. Treasure and Sega also brought us Astro Boy, the Omega Factor. I'm not sure who asked for this. I've never been a fan of Astro Boy, and I doubt he's popular enough to sell a game, at least in North America. And that might be why people rarely mention this one. But what is Treasure going to do with the license? Make a bad game? Of course not! This is an action platformer where you play as a nearly naked robot boy that has a ton of firepower. You can punch, kick, shoot your finger laser, blast through the air, do a super laser, and you even have your trusty butt bullets. Usually, you need to defeat a certain number of enemies before the screen will let you advance. After you meet certain characters, you can power yourself up one point at a time, kind of similar to Advanced Guardian Heroes. The control is very good, and you'll get the hang of Astro Boy's moves in no time. There are even a lot of cutscenes for you to skip. The visuals are once again done very well, with lots of parallax, scaling, and rotation, though not as much as Gunstar Super Heroes. However, this one loves blocky sprites. Why draw the enemies bigger when you can just scale up the small ones to save memory and time? Be sure to check this one out if you want to play as a proto Mega Man before Mega Man existed, which plays nothing like Mega Man. No, seriously, this one's good. Another series of games I need to briefly mention are the Castlevanias. I talked about these in great detail in my Metroidvania episode, so I'll keep it short here. But please, definitely check that episode out. It started with Circle of the Moon, which was a launch game in North America. It's kind of stiff, but it's super fun with great music. Harmony of Dissonance was next. The music wasn't so hot in this one, but the gameplay and graphics took a fairly big leap forward. Well, except for those dumb outlines around the characters. And they saved the best for last with Aria of Sorrow. This one is just outstanding, and every Game Boy Advance owner should try to play through this one if they can. These are all in the Metroidvania style, of course. These games alone made owning a Game Boy Advance totally worth it for me. Metroid 4 showed up on the Game Boy Advance as Metroid Fusion. Samus has been infected with something called X, and cells from a Metroid saved her, and now she's all messed up and yada yada yada. All you need to know is, is that it's Metroid. I would say that this is a Metroidvania, but it's not. It's just Metroid. No Vania here. Except for that part where you have to kill Dracula. It's a really fun game full of exploration. I will say that I did have a bit of trouble trying to get Samus to jump off of the hanging ledges, but only in a few particular spots. 
Still, the stages are mostly well designed beyond that. And of course, you still need to rediscover all of your powers. At least this game gives you a reason as to why you no longer have them. But what good would a Metroid game be if you started fully powered up anyway? Expanding your abilities is half the fun, at least. I'm not a huge fan of collecting the glitchy globs that float around, but that's only a very minor complaint. The graphics are pretty good, but sparse in a lot of areas. There doesn't seem to be as much variety here as there was in Super Metroid. And I'm not fond of the blue and yellow look of Samus. Samus? Samus? Whatever. But what's that? <gasps> I think there's something going on here, guys. Got a little mystery on our hands. The music is ambient, but honestly, it doesn't have the chops to pull off the mood as well as Super Metroid did. Still, don't let that deter you. This is an awesome game. later came Metroid Zero Mission, which is a remake of the original from the NES. I really, really love this game. It doesn't bog you down with much text at all. In fact, there's barely any narrative to the game, and it doesn't suffer as a result. I've always had a fascination with the original Metroid, but playing it was problematic without a map. And you also had to write down passwords. Now it's been given a very Super Metroid-like makeover with all of the things we've come to expect from that game. As a result, this game can finally shine the way it was meant to. Lots of stuff is familiar here, and of course they took some liberties, which is totally fine by me. They added save rooms, map rooms, new areas, and more. And now, some chozos will show you where you need to go next via the map screen. The graphics are all extremely well done, and I love them. I really can't find anything to gripe about here, and I love to gripe. The music is also exceptional. Most of that is based on the NES original, which itself was amazing, so no surprise here. Yes, it's still a little grainy sounding, but it's not bad. It really does a fantastic job setting the ambient mood. Or ambiance, if you're fancy. The Game Boy Advance is definitely a phenomenal platform for Metroid-style adventures with these two, plus the three Castlevania games. <laughs> The Super Nintendo was well known for its RPGs, many of which were ported over to the system. But how about the original RPGs or even strategy RPGs? Are they worth your time or mine? But first, there's a game that I had to buy right when it came out because I was curious if it could live up to its namesake. I'm a huge fan of Super Monkey Ball, so I just had to purchase Super Monkey Ball Jr. Keep in mind that I am not a very smart man. Obviously, it scaled way down from the GameCube game, and I'm surprised that they even attempted it. It almost feels like a broken 32X game. I kid, it's not that bad. But it is extremely slow, and of course, the frame rate isn't that great either. Also, you don't have the benefit of analog controls, and it feels like there's a touch of control lag as well. The courses have been designed for this in mind somewhat, but it still can be kind of frustrating. There are four minigames here, all of them multiplayer, some of them requiring multiple systems being linked together. Monkey Fight is really fun, but man, that sound is pretty bad. I really don't know what I was expecting from this game, but like I said, I had to try it and now I am sharing my pain. Want an RPG? Well, how about Golden Sun from Camelot? These are the same developers behind Shining Force and Shining the Holy Ark and all of those games. If you've played any of those, you'll notice the similarity in styles here. The characters all have weird ticks. Look at that. They really do that a lot, too. I'm not sure why they do that, but I'm not a fan of it because it does slow down the pacing since it happens so often. But whatever. This game revolves around a psychic power called Synergy. Basically, this is just super fancy telekinesis, but it can be used for a lot more than just moving stuff. It can do stuff like revitalize your health, and of course it can be used in battle. Speaking of battles, the ones here are random and they happen all the time. 
As far as the story goes, it's typical and nothing really out of the ordinary for an RPG. I did find it hard to get used to moving stuff with my synergy at first though. Still, the game is put together very well, and aside from the extremely verbose characters and their weird tics, it's quite enjoyable. The graphics are nicely done and I really like the colors and art. The music is immediately recognizable to me as being from a toy Sakuraba who always does the music for Camelot, and of course it's very good. Golden Sun 2 The Lost Age is also on the system. This one is set up just like the first game and uses a lot of the same characters. It seems to have slightly better pacing. You get into the meat of the game sooner, or at least it felt like that to me. The battles are the same and they seem to have been tightened up slightly. If you like wordy RPGs, then you'll really enjoy both of these games. The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap is the only original Zelda game for the system, at least for a single player and therefore the only one I can really show you. This one was made by Capcom oddly, but they did a great job. It has all of your familiar Zelda trappings, such as weapons and items that you can assign to different buttons, dungeons you need to find keys to solve, as well as light puzzles. I appreciate that the game doesn't waste a lot of time with preamble, you're into it fairly quickly. Zelda's been kidnapped and a new evil sorcerer threatens the land, but he broke the only sword that the humans can use to defend themselves from said evil. So your job is to speak to the Minish who can repair the sword. These are small creatures who only speak to young people like yourself. Along the way, you get a green dude who affixes himself to your head. He helps you out throughout your adventure with advice and whatnot. He also shows you how to shrink down to the size of the Minish. When you're small, you need to be extremely careful of water. You can grow and shrink anytime you see a portal, and there are plenty of them around. Anyway, that's the game's main gimmick, and thankfully it's not horribly annoying. The visuals are very well done, especially when you're playing a small Link. Capcom brought their own style to the game, and I like it. I mean, don't get me wrong, it still looks very Zelda-ish. The sound is also very good, with most of the familiar tunes you're used to in the series and some nice original ones. Pretty much a must-have for the system, unless you hate Zelda for some weird reason. How about a strategy RPG? Okay, so Advance Wars doesn't really have much in the way of RPG, but it's a great tactical game. It's also pretty easy to learn if you played any other similar game before. However, in this one, you'll need to resupply your units if you can keep your supply trucks alive. You can also capture enemy buildings. That'll show them. Each side gets one turn per day. Yeah, each turn takes an entire day. There are also options you can set like fog, so you can't see all of the enemy units at a given time and they can't see all of yours. I don't like this option at all, at least when playing by myself, but if you're playing with another human, it might add some surprise to the mix. The game is very snappy and the battle animations look great. However, I did find this one pretty difficult for such a game. It's probably best played multiplayer, I think. That, of course, was followed up by Advance Wars 2. Naturally, it's more of the same, but with some welcome improvements. For one, your maps are usually bigger. Secondly, and most importantly, you need to purchase and deploy your own battle force from your base during the battle. And you can buy anything you want as much as you want, just as long as you can keep the cash flowing. I like that they didn't fix what wasn't broken, and you can't go wrong here. <laughs> Fire Emblem was made by the same developer, and it's definitely a real strategy RPG. This is actually the seventh game in the series, but the first to be released in North America. This one plays more like the Shining Force games, and that's a very good thing. You have the same type of units. Those who can attack the nearest space like swordsmen, archers who attack a space further away, and even flying units. 
In this game, you can visit homes that are on the map and potentially gain information, money, or even new members that fight with you. Like Shining Force, you'll gain some experience for each battle no matter the outcome. Unlike Advance Wars, you don't have to manually end your turn after you're done moving all your people around and have told them to wait or attack. However, if one of your characters dies in battle, they stay dead forever, just like real life. But if you don't like it, just reload your save and try that battle again, also just like real life. All in all, this is a great strategy game. Two years later, Fire Emblem The Sacred Stones was released. This is mostly more of the same, and it's every bit as good, maybe even a little better. Maybe that's because you can turn off hints right from the beginning. This allows you to get into the nitty gritty that much quicker. You can't go wrong with either of these games unless you absolutely hate strategy RPGs. Still, everyone should try it just to see if they like it. Okay, for this last segment, I'm just gonna throw some games in there that I thought were interesting. A couple of them are decently popular. The others, definitely some hidden gems. I'm too hidden for these gems, too hidden for these gems, many hidden gems. Let's just get on with it. Next up is WarioWare Incorporated or WarioWare Inc. This game is basically just a set of super short mini-games. I loved the idea at the time. I like things that are absurd, and this game is definitely that. Basically, you're given a single word instruction like grab or defend. Then, you literally only have a few seconds to figure out what you're doing, how to do it, and then complete the task. For example, you need to catch this rod when it drops by pressing the button. Or, move back and forth on a unicycle to balance your load. You'll fail often because you just won't have time to figure it out. Once you fail four times, it's game over. If you win, it keeps going and going, but of course it gets harder and faster. Er, yeah. But believe me, you'll have to fail some of these a few times before you can figure them out. Only then will you know what to expect and how to beat it. Each character generally has their own minigames that they throw at you, but you'll often see ones repeated. The presentation of the game is amazing, with extremely well done and often silly graphics. It also has some of the best use of the Game Boy Advance sound hardware. While this game is a blast, the one thing it doesn't have is staying power. You'll get tired of it after a day or two. But then you can ignore it for years and years like I did and then try it again and have more fun. This was followed up by WarioWare Twisted, which used a gyroscopic sensor in the cartridge for motion controls. Yeah, no thanks. But this first entry here is still a hoot and a holler, for a couple of days at least. Speaking of Wario, there's Wario Land 4, or Wario. Does anyone say Wario instead of Wario? This one is more of a traditional 2D platformer. A pyramid has been discovered somewhere, so Wario drives down to find all of the riches hidden inside. <laughs> Wario, so greedy. You need to find four pieces of a gem in each stage. Once you find all the gems in that world, you unlock the door to the boss fight. There are a lot of things that Wario can do that Mario can't, and it can be kind of tough to get used to a few of the moves. You have to remember to engage the smash power before you jump, not vice versa like I keep trying to do. Decades of other platforming games taught me to jump before I attack, so it's just a little weird. It's not a knock against it though. Sometimes you have to pick something up and carry it somewhere, or even throw something. There are lots of things that can happen to you, like getting smashed flat, getting blown up into a balloon, or even turned into a nasty zombie. Ew, that's gross! This isn't your typical Mario clone, that's for sure. But once you get used to everything, it's pretty fun. There are also some minigames you can play, since I guess Wario is all about the minigames. Wait, could this baseball game be in TAPE MODE? 
The graphics are extremely colorful and detailed, and they don't disappoint at all. There's lots of scaling and rotation effects everywhere as well. The music is what you'd expect, which is kind of bouncy, maybe slightly evil. Check this one out, you might like it. Metal Slug even got a little love in the form of Metal Slug Advance. Though I've got to say, this is probably my least favorite Metal Slug game, but it's still not bad. You choose between two brand new characters as you start your mission. Then you choose your mission on the world map as they open up. From there, it's mostly standard Metal Slug action except that most of the animation has been drastically cut back. There's also no blood here, not even gray sweat. The game is still brutal though, and it only gives you one life. The good news is that there are checkpoints and you do have unlimited continues. After you get back to your camp, you can save your game so you don't have to go through the entire thing at once. During gameplay, whenever you collect a random item, it'll stop everything just so it can tell you that you got a card. Like, why do I care? Back in camp, you can view the cards that you got, but again, I see no reason to care about this. Still, other than the lacking animation, the graphics are done very well. And so is the sound. It sounds just like a Neo Geo Metal Slug game, right down to how very mono it is. So definitely not horrible, but there are many better Metal Slug games out there that you could play instead. Car Battler Joe is an interesting little car RPG of sorts from Ancient, the people behind Streets of Rage 2. It's like they took the RPG mode from Final Lap Twin on the TurboGrafx-16, took out the random battles, and added guns. U-Star is Joe, who wants to be a car battler, and of course soon sets on his way. It begins in an overhead RPG world with shops and all of that familiar stuff. Soon, you begin doing courier jobs to earn experience and money. You have a car that gets equipped with a gun to help battle off bandits and whatnot. The car scenes take place on Mode 7 style tracks. You're shown which way to go via the blue route arrow that moves around the screen, but it can be kind of crazy at times. Usually it won't let you down though. Early on, you're just delivering goods that are essential for survival like medicine or burgers. You can buy and equip better parts for your car with the money that you earn. Eventually, you'll be tasked with specific missions that move the game's plot along like trying to recover some stolen goods for a family. I've got to admit, the game can be kind of addictive. I kept wanting to get to the next area, despite the overall lack of variety. I mean, I didn't care, I just wanted to see what was next. It's easy and fun to play, and they certainly didn't overdo the RPG elements. The music by Yuzo Koshiro gives the game a unique feel, but it's not necessarily something you'd want to listen to outside of the game. Overall, it's a good time if you want a little racing adventure on your Game Boy Advance. Iridian 2 is a really nice vertical shooter for this system. Well, okay, it's not really vertical. It's one of those where it's angled a bit, but it plays just like a vertical shooter. Basically, you fly a ship around and shoot things. Before each stage, you can choose what type of weapon you'd like to bring, as well as if you'd like it to power up automatically. I always choose auto, and I've never had an issue with it or felt like it needed to be anything more. Over on the right side of the screen, you have all of your weapons and can eventually collect some more. There's a tutorial I went through once that explained all of this, but I found it boring. I didn't go through the tutorial this time, and I had no issues whatsoever. Not that I know of, anyway. If you hold down the fire button, you have a rapid fire shot. If you double tap the fire button and hold, you can charge up a powerful shot. This works fine, but I just wish it could have been assigned to the other button since that one doesn't seem to do anything. At least in auto mode, it doesn't. A lot of the stage designs remind me of Viewpoint for the Neo Geo. The game is pretty easy, and you should be able to complete the first five or six stages without dying once, and there are a total of 15 stages. Just keep collecting the power-ups and they'll help restore your life meter once you're fully powered up on that weapon. Because of this, your weapon level resets to its weakest point at the beginning of each stage. Still, it's really fun and I never get bored. 
though I think mainly that's because of the outstanding music from Manfred Linsner, who is also one of the programmers. It's very Euro, and it's in the style of Chris Hulsbeck. Each and every stage without exception has great music that's not only well composed, but really pushes the sound quality limits of the system. My only gripe is that it isn't in stereo. The graphics are also amazing, even though they're mostly pre-rendered. Some stages definitely don't look as nice as the others, but it's still really cool to see this on a portable system. If you like shooters, check this one out. Well, there's the Game Boy Advance. I know I didn't cover every single game. I left out maybe three or four, but it should give you a taste of what the Game Boy Advance is all about. And I love this system. It has so much going for it. Anyway, what do you think of the Game Boy Advance? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Introducing the new Game Boy Advance from Nintendo. The hot new portable system that's so advanced, you'll have to evolve to play it. Advance! The Nintendo Game Boy Advance. Now you're playing with power. Advanced power.